All right. So I'm an audiologist and also an experimental psychologist. And I'm going to share with you my perspectives on why it matters. But more importantly, I'm going to share with you the perspectives of a particular older adult who lives with hearing loss. And this was a woman who attended a talk I gave on hearing and aging at a meeting of the Canadian Heart of Hearing Association. And she says, when you are hard of hearing, you struggle to hear. When you struggle to hear, you get tired. When you get tired, you get frustrated. When you get frustrated, you get bored. When you get bored, you quit. And she was feeling very victorious because she said, I didn't quit today. And I think what we would like for all healthy older adults is for them not to quit. But unfortunately, many of them avoid this cascade of problems from hearing issues to cognitive issues to emotional issues to social issues by simply withdrawing from social interaction. And that is absolutely not where we want people to go. Now, many of the speakers already this morning talked about how aging is a gradual process. We heard about the 20 years that Catherine took before she sought help for her hearing loss. We have before us here something you're going to see over and over and over again. We've heard about audiograms. This is the ISO median thresholds for men and women across the decades of life. And I've drawn that red line because all of the lines, all the marks above are in the normal range, clinically speaking, in terms of this pure tone average Frank spoke about. Below the line, you're in the abnormal range. So what we see here is that, in fact, for women at the age of 70 and men at the age of 60, half of the population actually is not in the zone that would be considered to be clinically significant hearing loss. Half of them are not yet candidates for hearing aids, but they have problems. Some of these problems are the accumulation of lifelong problems. Some of them are specific age-related problems that manifest in those high-frequency losses in the audiogram. Some of their hearing deficits are not seen in the audiogram. They're also invisible to the clinician because we're not measuring them. And so my point here is there are many types of age-related hearing loss. There is heterogeneity, and we really have to think about what happens in the early stages, and that's what I'm going to draw your attention to now. So people have understood that people who still have pretty good audiograms, who can have a, quite an easy time in a quiet ideal situation, even more than for younger people, what older people have are these difficulties in what I would call challenging listening conditions. And these are conditions where there might be noise, like traffic noise. There could be multiple talkers. You could be unfamiliar with the talkers, what they're talking about. You could be multitasking, as Dr. Ferrucci mentioned. We're always multitasking, usually, while we're listening and doing something else. The pace could be fast. You could be challenged because you're trying to get used to a new technology, like a hearing aid. Or, heaven forbid, you have a serious health issue and you're in a healthcare encounter and you're trying to understand what your doctor is trying to tell you. So healthcare situations have to be right up there in the top list of challenging listening conditions. So how do people deal with healthcare in general when they have a hearing loss? And again, what we don't want is for these everyday realistic challenging conditions to be the kinds of situations where you stay home, as Catherine told us that she did. All right, so what we could do is just ask people, how do you do out there in everyday life? We could give a questionnaire like the speech, spatial, and qualities of hearing scale. And we would find big age differences on the items that had to do with conversing in an adverse environment and where we have to use that cognitive energy to focus and switch attentions like you would have to do in any kind of social interaction in a group. And the poor scores that we see circled in red for many of the older adults on that scale, we would not know from their audiogram, and we would not know from simple words and noise measures that clinicians might do in the clinic. So the plot thickens. What is it about everyday life? Let's move to some more complicated speech materials. You know, we're going to like a full sentence. This isn't a lecture. It's just a sentence. And we have the speech perception and noise test lists where 
In a list, there are 50 sentences. The person has to repeat the sentence final word. Half of the sentences give a clue to what is the word that is coming up. There's a context. Stir your coffee with a spoon. A zebra has black and white. OK, you knew what I was going to say. So you got a head jump on me because you could deploy context. The rest of the sentences do not have helpful context. John did not talk about the spoon. So we give this test in a range of signal to noise conditions. And I hope you're going to hear a lot more about signal to noise ratios today. Roughly speaking, we're going from plus 20 being like a quiet living room to minus 5 being in a noisy aircraft. So the kinds of conditions you're in every day. Without context, 50% of the words are correct for a young person just below 0. 50% are correct for an old person above 0. So we can quantify the challenge of noise to an older person with a pretty good audiogram, we're not even talking about hearing loss yet, as being about 3 dB. We can also look at the difference between the performance for the high context versus the low context sentences, the little green horizontal lines. And kind of nicely, the older people get more benefit from that context than the young also to the magnitude of about 3 dB. So what does this tell us? The young and the old are doing the job of listening. They're arriving at a performance level, but they're doing it in different ways. Young people are using the signal. Old people who have had gradual changes in their hearing for a long time are using more of their brain to get the job done. Could we simulate this? We heard a nice simulation from James. Well, in our experiments, we simulated the temporal aspects of auditory aging. And we can make the performance of the young people drop down to the level of the old people. So we can simulate the signal to noise challenge. But then what happens? Once you get that signal, what do you do with it? And part of development in general is that there are gains and losses. So in cognitive development, there are gains and losses. So what happens? We saw that old people use context more. When we put the young people in the simulation, they also use context, but putting them in that, uh, somebody used the word garbled, I think, uh, Frank did, the garbled experience of listening, old people are much more proficient at using context. They've developed a way of doing this over time. Young people do not get instantly better at using context when faced with a garbled input. On the loss side, we can also make young people remember like old people when they have that little distortion in the signal. Okay, So we see the consequences, the declines in processing that might be secondary to poor signal input we can simulate that in young people. What we can't simulate are the long-term compensatory processes to use semantic knowledge. So we have these old people over 20 years listening, using their brain to do the work that their ears can't do so well, so efficiently. And what happens when we have them in a clinic and we're giving them the Montreal Cognitive Assessment to find out if they have mild cognitive impairment? Well, if you can't hear the word, how could you remember it? So that's kind of a no-brainer, no pun intended. Uh, but let's just, take, let's just take the words which in the learning trials people did repeat correctly, and how well do they remember them. So the older adults with good hearing have much higher blue bars. They're recalling the items at a delay, which they could successfully repeat in the learning trials. The people with hearing loss have more equal blue and red bars. So they repeated those words. Does that prove they heard it? Well, at some level they did, but they can't remember it a few minutes later. If we look at the difference over the five words in the delayed recall portion of the MOCA, there is no difference on the most recent word. Where the groups are different are on the first words in the list. So you hear it with difficulty you can succeed in repeating it, but you can't hold on to it. You can't do things with it like remember it. You can't do all of the uh, cognitive things that you would like to do. 
let's just kind of push this a little further to some social and emotional connections like we heard in that initial quote. We have been playing around with uh, some data. This is some Swedish data from the Bachelor study and also some of the data from those same people that did the MOCA test in Toronto, about 300 in each group. And in this model, we see that age contributes to changes in hearing and memory. Hearing contributes to changes in memory. And that uh, through cognition, hearing results in reduced uh, social participation. So we have that cascade. And uh, I think somehow part of, part of what you're going to hear in these two days is that we really have to unpack that cascade using various research approaches and to use those to inform practice. So I would say to you, hearing loss is diagnosed medically, but it's experienced socially. That there are ear brain networks which are plastic. In the short run, there's compensation by using knowledge. In the short run and ultimately in the long run, there is deterioration in processing and understanding information as it goes down in time. There are interactions with social uh, situations. The physical environments are enormously challenging and accessibility is a problem. That people with hearing loss, there are health implications in terms of how do we promote healthy and active aging? How do we even uh, save them from adverse events that they are going to encounter because of communication problems? How do we facilitate uh, their ability to self-manage health issues? How do we get them to adhere and benefit from all kinds of intervention for all kinds of health issues that rely on communication? So I, I disagree with Jim that the solutions are not all there. We have some auditory solutions, but we need to put it together with a broader uh, perspective that includes the cognitive, social, and environmental approaches.